think all my father's family back till the early 19th century um, were one way or another in the military um, and uh, often serving in India in, in various various parts. And, and so I was the first of a generation probably for 200 years, which didn't, wasn't in the army. And for that, I'm very grateful. Um, and so the, yes, the idea of, of, of nonviolence came through, I think, reading sort of environmental writers, um, Jonathan Porritt in England, uh, and so on, and actually realizing the sort of, I suppose, the deeper roots of, let's say, modern environmentalism, 20th, late 20th century English environmentalism, and how that went back to Gandhi. So that was, I think that's where, it's, where it started, that actually, I suppose, caring for the planet has a deeper root in, 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 a, in a philosophy of nonviolence, I think. In a sense, um, the way I've, so I suppose, seen how you do you achieve nonviolence is through the, the language of sustainable development. So when I was doing my, my master's degree in international relations, um, it was the time of the Brundtland Report, Grove Harlem Brundtland, uh, who, who had this report on the Commission on Environment and Development and came up with this theory of, of, of sustainable development in the late 1980s. Um, uh, so really before this whole globalization wave started, and I did my thesis on the theory of need in, uh, in, in, in international relations. And I think that's that sense of how we meet needs, um, not necessarily in a hierarchical way, but how we meet needs together, obviously basic needs for food and shelter, but also for sort of spiritual expression and, and, and fulfillment, and how the market creates uh, these commodities and commodifies things which are, are not commodities. So people, um, often in business, we call them human capital, which is actually, if you, again, if you look at behind the term, is a terrible idea. Uh, human capital only really exists where you have slavery, that you have someone you own and you trade. So human capital, again, sounds like a reasonable idea, but is a terrible idea. And then obviously land as well, that is commodified. And again, now we talk of natural capital, which in many ways is a nice reformist idea because we want to think about the stocks of nature and their flows and so on. But again, perhaps within it has a sort of a, a worm of, of which actually makes us again commodify nature. So that's for me was, was um, Polanyi's great insight that actually many of the things in the markets um, actually create these false commodities, which, which are not um, and will not remain as commodities. People will rebel if they're treated just as human capital. Nature will collapse if you treat it purely as natural capital. The, the project we have is to establish a coexistence uh, whereby we recognize our place within nature. We're not separate from nature. And I think that has Did been obviously one of the, the things that has happened, uh, particularly in the Western tradition. But I mean, so that sort of re recognizing that coexistence, our place in nature, our place actually in some ways to actually uh, enhance nature, uh, the just transi transition. Um, so as we move to the green economy, how do we make sure that that actually is a tool for uh, improving the well-being, particularly of the most vulnerable? Um, so as we end coal, how do we ensure, let's say in India, that the, the people who are living in the coal regions who probably have terrible lives, mafia, poor conditions, air pollution, how can their lives be enriched and so on? So this is not just a sort of environmentalist, no coal, but actually is a just transition to a, a greener, but also a more, uh, yeah, more fulfilling um, civilization. So that's what I'm working on a lot on, 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 on finance. So we have got to the, end, to the end of the beginning. This is where it starts. Uh, and then we need to think about transforming the financial system uh, as a whole. That was a recognition that this question of sustainability was not just about an individual company, an individual portfolio, but actually was something for the system as a whole. And therefore, the guardians of the financial system, the central banks, they need to have a role. And I think that's one of the more interesting uh, issues now. You now have a group called the Network for Greening the Financial System. Now, global. It's a global is, network? A global network. It is not set up by Greenpeace. It is set up <laughs> by the Banque de France. It has 80 members including now the Federal Reserve, the Mexican Central Bank, the Singaporean Central Bank, the South Africans, the Brazilians, the Dutch, the French, the Germans, 
The RBI, Reserve Bank of India, I think will be joining very soon. They're already starting to incorporate climate as a risk in some of their, their analysis. So now I think there's a consensus that the guardians of the financial system, those who are charged with stability, need to think about climate change as a stability, but also need to think again about how they can shape the purpose of finance. How can the purpose of finance be shaped to deliver this transition that we want?